happy, happy Saturday to you and welcome back to our Push Past 10 platform. As you know, we are your number one source for promoting and celebrating who we are as Dominicans as, and as people of Caribbean heritage. And you know, we continue to grow exponentially with over 10,000 visitors to our platform every month. So as always, we thank you for your support and for sharing our efforts to be a positive light in this very dark world. So Push Pass Nation, check in, check in. Let us know that you're here. Let us know where you're joining us from. We have another wonderful guest for you today, a man who has traveled the world sharing his talents uh, and his skills while firmly holding true to his Dominican heritage, holding firm to his Caribbean heritage. So Mr. Daryl Tula is joining us all the way from Europe, from Austria to be exact. Um, he is here to share with us the power of the performing arts, not only to be a source of entertainment, but to heal the world and to resolve conflicts. So we are truly grateful that he's joining us today. So don't forget to tell everyone that we are here uh, for another great exchange. And of course, we are looking forward to your interaction on this program. So as always, don't forget to share the live as we uh, get ready for another wonderful celebration of who we are. And don't forget to click on that notification button so that you never miss when we go live. So again, it is wonderful to be here with you for another uh, engaging conversation. And just in case you're wondering, yes, Daryl Tulo is the brother of Arno Tulo, who is also another phenomenal artist who has been here on our program. He has been on, on our platform as well. So let us give a warm welcome to our guest, Mr. Daryl Tulo. Daryl, thank you for joining us and welcome to the program. Let me unmute your mic. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Simone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to be part of your community and to be invited on the show. Really looking yeah. forward. Yes, thank you. So you're what, six hours ahead of us? So it's actually evening for you? Yeah, it's coming up to midnight, you could say. So it's been a long day. <laughs> Yes. Hey, I've, been, I've been looking forward to it and um, and so we're so here we are six hours apart but uh, still connected middle of the day for you middle of the night for me yes. um, but here we are all connected thanks to this amazing platform yes. and thanks, to the work, thanks to the work that you are doing with getting everybody who has been working outside of Dominica for such a long time back into the community and back into conversation thank you Yes, yes, yes. So good evening to you because it's uh, actually nighttime where you are. And good evening to everyone who's watching from the other side of the world. So again, we are uh, thankful that you're joining us as, as we talk about how we can all use our skills, our talents, our experiences to positively impact the world. So again, if you're just logging on today, we are joined by International Performing Arts and Theatre Director, Dominican-born Mr. Daryl Tulo, as we discuss conflict resolution and healing the world through the performing arts. And it is so important that we're having this discussion today because with so much suffering and discord and anger in the world. It is the perfect time to have Daryl join us to share how he is positively impacting the world. And, and Daryl, on, on your projects, we will look, one of the projects we will look at today is your project called Oh Maria. And I can't believe after all these months that we've been talking, we accidentally selected the anniversary of Hurricane Maria to do this program. So do you believe in coincidence? Not at all. There's, there's no such thing as coincidence. You know, everything falls into place and uh, sometimes you, you see it coming and sometimes you don't see it coming. And, and here we are yes. on the anniversary of, of, uh, of Maria. Yes. You know, I was, um, I was sitting practically here um, 
in this in this very room uh, the night before. You know, um, I had met uh, incidentally. I had met my dear friend Eloise Green, who was passing through Vienna on the afternoon, and we had a coffee somewhere, a very nice place. And we were thinking, oh my God, there's a hurricane coming. You know, like heading heading towards, and here we're just sitting like so so far away. And I came home, and the last um, SMS that I looked at on my phone was the hurricane was just like a couple of hours away from Dominica, and it was like category three still. Mm -hmm. So I figured, okay, I can I can go to bed. I can. And then afterwards, there was when when I woke up the next morning, there was no connection, no connection to Dominica, and um, it took a couple of hours. Um, when a friend from Canada sent me an SMS, and and then it was just like too much information, too much distance, too overwhelming. And what the hell do you do? Nothing. Mm -hmm. um, helplessness, total helplessness, mm -hmm. and this this feeling of being in a void, not being able to get in contact with anybody, and then seeing these these photos. There were first photos from the air. Somebody had been over the air with a helicopter, and so. The first information was just like matchsticks strewn over the landscape, not a living person in sight. Um, and this this really heavy feeling of, um, yeah, what the hell can you do? You can't do anything until you know what's going on. And I survived Hurricane David in 1979. Um, so uh, there's like firsthand experience there. And um, it took a while for me to be able to catch my breath. and. Um, yeah, and if we if we just jump a couple of months later to to o Maria, this happened because I managed to get a whole set of um, fellow artists, performers, and producers to come together with me, stand on stage um, in Graz in in this in this wonderful theater, and raise thirty three thousand euros in a gala evening where all of the performers were, of course totally like it was solidarity we'll be there we'll do this people pulled all stops out and um we created this uh it was a gala the the, the daryl toulon and friends for hurricane maria a gala in graz in one evening one performance the performance itself was just like song and dance was very long, very compact. Everybody giving everything. It was from classical music until rock. There was um, classical dancing. There was, um, I think, there was some salsa. There was like freestyle improvisation. A lot of singers. Shadi Bully was flown in from New York, so she danced, and um, we raised all of this money. And I was thinking, wow, what is what is then the next step? And how how amazing it was to combine music. Um, for people to change their minds about what to do in a situation of a hurricane. Um, yeah, and, 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 and we're gonna we're gonna get more into that. So we're looking forward to finding out more about how you raised the money and how you actually got the performance going on the ground. But before we do so, let's just find out a little bit about who is Daryl Tula. So for those of us who are kind of geographically uh, challenged, where is Austria? Austria is like you leave the Caribbean and you head up across the Atlantic almost towards the UK. Just before you get to the UK, you take a right, you keep going over the Alps, and when the Alps finish, that's that's where that's where I am in Vienna, middle of middle of Austria, mainland uh, mainland Europe. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. So kind of just tell us about your formative years growing up in Dominica that created that foundation of who you are today, your family, your education, and your early experiences in the performing arts. So, uh, well, um, I suppose like 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 many people know, I'm I'm not just the the brother of Arnold Tulo. I'm also the son of Ma Tulo, who is responsible for so many people's um, view of life, I suppose, um, having been a teacher at the convent high school for so many years. I, I, every time I go back home, people not asking me, Daryl, how are you doing? It's like, how's your mom? Um, so that, I suppose, is where, where it starts, coming from the large Toulon family. My dad was um, control of Inland Revenue Department, so um, he was also quite a uh, quite a quite, a, quite a, a figure that people know. People also remember him for his beautiful singing voice, 
Um, he sang with Dr. Waddy's Goodwill Choirs, as so did my mom. Um, so here we come. Uh, I think in our house there was a, a, a feeling of, of large family, um, a lot of encouragement, and always a lot of music. I seem to remember there's always a concert, a choir practice, or a performance, or something that we um, that we went to, that we enjoyed. I enjoyed going to. We listened to a lot of music, and so this was always a part of a part of the life. Um, my first music teacher was Miss Potter, who was the organist at the cathedral. And I suppose um, um, my mum must have realized that me being up on the choir with her was much more important what I was seeing the the, the, the organist doing than, than actually the, uh, the mass of the celebration. So I went off to Miss Potter and started doing piano lessons at a really tender age, um, very, very young. Uh, um, I couldn't tell you exactly, but like really early on. Um, and then graduated to Leng Sorendo, who was my piano teacher for several years. Um, together with Leng, I, I, I studied for the, the Royal Academy of Music syllabus and did a lot of the exams and um, played the piano, did a lot of uh, um, singing. I actually sang with Dr. Waddy's choir when I was really little. I think the song was, um, As I Walk Down the Road at Set of Sun, collector's item. If anybody has a recording of that, don't play it. <laughs> it would be interesting though. Um, but there was I, this little sort of like pint-sized um, um, singer among all of these grown-ups like, um, yeah, but holding my own and feeling totally comfortable about being on stage. For me, it was, it was just like the, the, the most natural, the most natural thing to be, you know, involved in a performance. Um, when I was really little also, um, my mom was doing the CHS um, Christmas pageant. And I was also um, always having my little solo roles, um, me and my teddy bear or whatever it was I was singing. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, this, this is going on. I went to convent prep and then graduated to St. Mary's Academy, um, during which time uh, there was uh, quite an incredible uh, theater scene going on in, in Dominica. This is like the 70s. Um, so Alwyn Bully and PAT coming up with productions every year, at least once every year, um, a, a beautiful theater production that we could look at. And my brother Paul had started a little theater company called National Youth Theater. This was also around the time when uh, the old mill was rediscovered um, for, for, for what it was and transformed into this cultural center. This is like really early days, the beginning of the 70s. And um, National Youth Theater, we were sort of like stationed at the, at the old mill. There was also um, another theater company um, that was run by somebody from Pottersville, who I do not remember his name. Um, somebody who, anybody who's watching, if you know this, like put it in the chat, we need this information. Um, but so there was a lot of stuff going on, and um, with the with with National Youth Theatre, there was also an, a production called Sun Moon and the Pretty Girl. I played Moon. My brother Arnold played Sun. The Pretty Girl was Margaret Rose Cool Slatig, and Deborah Gage was the good fairy. My brother Paul was the bad fairy. Um, <laughs> remember if there was anybody else of, of importance in there but um hey we were on stage and we totally owned it and every time i had been on stage i was just like that was just like the the, the place to be and i started my own little uh, theater company uh, the young cultural dramatists together with guys like leroy waddix and francis orley stephen joseph Irvin mcintyre Martha and Thompson Fountain, um, Glenda Lander, a couple of other people, Julia Aaron. And um, in 1979, the year that Hurricane David came out, we had presented the Age of Aquarius, one program of which I have here still with me, The Evidence, that's Julia and Stephen on the, on the cover. And we performed at St. Jared's Hall in Portsmouth at the RBD Cinema and also in Grand Four. And I think one week after we came back down to Rosso, Hurricane David came, and that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. And so, in all of this time, um, I'm growing up with, uh, with 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 people who are involved in theater, who are doing, who are writing, who are singing, who are performing. 
um, there was such a vibrant scene of music. I mean, um, Handel's Messiah we, was sung, you know, like regularly. The music was always on Stena's crucifixion at, at Easter time. Um, even my uh, there was a, a, a perform a production of uh, the Gondoliers, which is Gilbert and Sullivan light opera. It's very, I suppose this would it would sound like really a strange sort of thing to to have happened in Dominica, but yes, it did. There was a time where all of this stuff was going on, and um, yeah, that takes us through up until 1980, I think, uh, where I was in a production of the Fantastics with Floriska Joseph. Florska Carter and um, Ingrid Angol, Slas Banis, um, the others fail me, who else was on stage with us. This was directed by Alwyn. And that was the last thing that I did on stage in Dominica before I left in 1981 to go to Europe to, to, to start my, my college education at the United World College of the Atlantic. Yes, so and thank you. And thank you Dominica. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get into um, your education and your training as well, but we always like to acknowledge everyone who's joining us via Facebook Live. I see my mom is here, Medina Senhal, so thank you for being here. We have Glenda Schillingford, happy Saturday, Simone, and then she says, Daryl Tulo, I could not miss this. Uh, welcome to the program. Uh, Roslyn is tuned in from New York. Great to see Daryl Tulo. Hi, family. Mr. Gordon Henderson, the legendary Kadas Lipso King himself, Gordon Henderson. Good evening, sir, because you're out in Paris. So like uh, our friend Daryl here, you're on the other side of the world where it's evening. So good evening. Beverly Johnson, always great to see you. She says, blessed Saturday to all. Thank you, Dr. Simone, for another wonderful program. Tina DeBell Ramon, cannot miss Daryl. Wow, Daryl, you're pretty popular for a guy who left so long. <laughs> Let's see who else we have with us. Uh, Glenda Simone is in an exceptional, great job with the interviews. Ah, oh, Derek, thank you. Uh, Glenda, I just missed someone. I wanna acknowledge everyone who are taking, who's taking time out to be here. And uh, Norman Stowe, thank you for being here. And Good old Norman. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know Norman. Yeah. Uh, Martha M uh, Maynard. Oh, wow. Thank you, Martha. It's great to see you too. Childhood friend. So proud of you. So Daryl, the, the audience is coming in and we're very grateful that they are joining us here. But just as an, a further way to introduce you, let me go ahead and read just a little bit of your bio so the audience can get a sense of who you are. So Daryl Tula was born in Dominica in 1964 and moved to Europe at the age of 17. Upon receiving his international bachelorate from the United Co World College of the Atlantic, Wales, he began dance studies first at Thamesdown Community Dance Center, Swindon, then at Central School of Ballet, London. He is a graduate of the cultural management course at the Institute for Cultural Concepts, Vienna, from 1987, he has worked regularly from his base in Germany as a dancer, teacher, choreographer, actor, and singer. He has since remained internationally active with professional and non-professional dancers and actors of all ages, working also in community and educational settings as ballet director of Opera Graz, 2001 to 2015, he engaged dancers and choreographers from 29 countries, thereby uh, championing cultural diversity, regularly uh, collaborated with protagonists of the Graz Free Scene, was jury member for several international choreographic competitions, and is on the advisory board of Graz Year of Culture for 2020. Daryl Tulor is the founder and artistic director of the Alpha Group and currently teaches dance arts at Anton Bruckner Private U University in Linz. His docu-dance theater project, In the Name of the Father, is being developed with children born of war in Bosnia and children born in captivity in Northern Uganda. Daryl Tulo was awarded the first Austrian dance production special prize 20, in 2002 
for successfully modernizing the, da the dance company of op Oprah Gratz, his community dance project through the Open Door 2015, created with young refugees and migrants residents in Graz was nominated as Place of Respect 2016. He was awarded the Syrian Golden Cross of Honor in 2016. Performance in the name of the father was invited to the Osijek Peace Awards for 2020 in Croatia. So Daryl, did I sum that up nicely? I think you just did. <laughs> did I miss anything? No, no, that's, 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 there, there's, there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. And to be honest, that's a condensed version. Um, but the, these are the main points. Yeah. Yeah. So, so before I read the bio, we were talking about your transition from Dominica. So tell us what that was like, because I'm sure it was difficult to leave your home at the tender age of 17 and, and travel across the ocean to a different continent and having to learn a new language, a new culture. So kind of just tell us what that experience was like for you. Okay, um, the, the, the move wasn't so traumatic um, because it was going from, from, from Dominica to England, to the United Kingdom. So the language wasn't a, wasn't a problem. And I was at this incredible college, United World College of the Atlantic is, um, is a college set up by Kurt Hahn, and so the principles of the college is um, international understanding, um, cultural awareness, and plurality of truths. And um, it was a full scholarship, um, and the location was a, a castle in Wales on the Bristol Channel looking over the water. Um, we had to do a lot of community service. We had a, lot, a, a very high academic program. Um, which involved uh, languages, um, some theory of knowledge, a little bit of philosophy. And um, of course, if you wanted to do sciences, then you did mathematics, um, physical science and biology, which is what I did. At the time, I thought I wanted to study medicine. Um, but I was in a, in a group of, uh, of young people from all over the world who were chosen not because of their pure academic interests, but because they as opposed to the selection committee looks for some sort of like human interest that you have that goes beyond the academics. And uh, the, the, the concept of the college is to, to train young people from all over the world together so that they understand each other, so that when they go out and become leaders um, in, in their countries, that there's a different sort of like world politics going on. And to tell you the truth, it works. Um, the for me the, the 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 big shock was was that during this time i realized that actually what i had been doing up until this point which was um subscribing to the idea of studying medicine or, or going into the sciences maybe it's something that i could have done but it's not what i really wanted to do my heart was just pulling somewhere else my heart was pulling me to that place where I always felt that I belonged from the time I was little on stage. You know, I'm directing, creating, performing, um, communicating with people through artistic means. And um, I had an epiphany in London, actually um, getting off at Piccadilly Circus. It was the winter of, of, of uh, 1981, getting off at Piccadilly Circus and walking down Shaftesbury Avenue if you are familiar with London, you know that that's theatre land, that's theatre street. There's just like one professional theatre after another. And by the time I got down to Cambridge Circus, my life had changed. I had fallen into a different universe. I had stepped out of where I was and I was now in this place where I knew that this is what I had to do. I had to be working in the performing arts in the theater professionally and and then the rest of the time um was spent trying to find out you know how how do you do this how do you start at the age of of, of 17 or 18 or, or or even 19 by the time i would be finished with the college it's 19 and just jump into this and um fortunately i had some very very good friends 
advisors who were able to put me on the right track. And um, after a, a very difficult second year, so the, the, the United World College is a two-year course, um, the second year was about finishing and making sure that I have my baccalaureate and I've written my extended essay and doing all of this, sealing the packet and then saying, okay, now I want to go and study this. And um, I was introduced to, to one actor, a friend of um, uh, a very dear friend, I, I think one of the angels in my life. One of the angels in my life organized a meeting for me to speak with a, a friend of hers who was an actor, professional actor. And I told him, you know, I really want to be in the theater. I want to be doing this. And he said, um, well, you can sing, you can dance, you can act. But uh, to be honest, you're going to have to choose one of those things. And dance is the most difficult one. And I was like, wait, fine. Well, let's start with dance. And then he said, um, uh, and you know, you kind of like, old and and the people who have the ballet um you know they're they're like way beyond everybody else because in every audition the ones who have the ballet technique they're at the front and i was like okay well i'll start with ballet and literally that's what was that what that's what the plan was i was like okay if that's what it takes then that's what it takes let's do that um so then I went from uh, my college in the United World College of the Atlantic in Wales to study dance, to start to study dance, an introduction course in a community um, dance studio, dance school in Thamesdown. And, um, you know, by this point, so by this point, I'm 19, I haven't had any ballet in any formal dance education, but um, I got through the audition by um by just being as honest as honest to god as 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 if my life depended on it and my life did depend on it i was granted a place i was granted a scholarship and um it turned out one of the things that made it attractive to give me a scholarship is that i could play the piano so i could play the piano for ballet class now here's the squeeze in one year Thames down. I was given a new home. I was given a new set of angels taking care of me, giving me very good advice. I was given a place to work, a place to study, and a place to learn. And in the one year, I learned ballet in my body by being a student on the bar, standing in class. And then almost with just enough time to change my teacher, sit down on the piano stool and play for the next ballet class. Thankfully, I had this incredible piano education. Thank you, Lang Sorrento. Thank you, Miss Potter. Um, I could improvise. I had a feeling I would. I had also studied composition at the college before, so it was very easy for me to go in and and provide music for the ballet class. And by sitting on the piano stool playing for class, I could see what the students were doing, what they were not doing, what was working for them and what was not working. I wasn't concerned about standing on my leg in this, in this situation, so I had a bit of distance. I was sitting on the piano providing music for them to be able to do that and putting myself in the place of the student thinking, what would I like in this exercise? You know, what should the music want to give me? And then one class later, I go back and I do it and I'm feeling what the pianist is not giving me. I'm thinking, okay, next time I sit down there, I'm going to do that. And so I'm learning, um, I'm learning on the inside of my body. It's, it's a muscular thing. I'm learning at the piano. It's a musical thing. I'm learning the, the, the in-between bits of the exercise while I'm actually doing it. That's on the micro level. On the macro level, I'm working with the teacher to be able to accompany a class for 90 minutes. So I'm getting... The, the like the bigger picture it's almost like a pedagogic project where i i, I can suss out the teaching the, the the teaching plan i i can suss out what the exercise is i can see the difference between um you know what the teacher is wanting to do and and what the exercise is actually getting you to do so there's like this incredible piece of learning going on in one year at the end of this year i got a scholarship to study at central school of ballet in london 
I mean, that is just, that is incredible. And I'm so happy that you're sharing all of this with us because it sounds like you went, I mean, kids, people who get scholarships uh, in ballet are usually performing ballet and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're training from the tender age of what, two, three, four? They and are training from very young, yes. 17 years old, so you're considered old because yes. you have At this point, I'm 19. training. 19. I'm 19 by this point, yeah. Yes, and just having the willpower and, and being open to observing what, what uh, it takes to be a good performer and, and, and being able to express the musical content that goes with the performance. You were yeah. able to gain so much of the experiences that you, you needed to thrive as a ballet dancer. So kind of just tell us how your career took off and where it led you to. Okay, so, so two and a half years um, at ballet school in, in, in London. And like everybody else, in the middle of the third year, so the course is a three-year course. In the middle of the third year, I went off to do my auditions. And I came back after one month of auditions. And I had five contract offers in my back pocket. I could choose. And so I chose not even to finish my third year. But in February of the third year, I joined the company in Cologne. Because, you know, there's no coincidences. Um, an opening, something was happening, and actually the, the, the director told me, I like you very much. Um, I do not have a contract for you right now, but I want you in my next piece. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, let's go with that flow. And so I, I, I went to Cologne, and I danced in the Cologne Opera for eight years as a soloist. I've never been a group dancer, by the way. I have never danced in the group. And wow. um, so starting from scratch and doing the my my ballet school, I was I've been working as a soloist. And I'm I'm very humbled and proud at the same time to say that I've had several large productions made created for me, like a production of Romeo and Juliet in Cologne, which was created for me as Romeo. And just so the audience understands, you mean Cologne, Germany? Cologne, Germany, yes. Cologne, Germany. And um, and then from Cologne, um, I worked in a lot of um, neighboring countries, let's say, um, but one very important one was being invited by the Opera House in Zurich to have a ballet, which is called Joseph's Legend. This ballet has quite a, a, an important history for, for modern dance from 1918, I think created for me. And if I wasn't going to dance the role of Joseph, the guy wasn't going to do it. Actually, he asked me, the, he asked the first time he, he, he approached me, I said, well, this is very nice. Thanks for the offer. But next year, my boss is doing Romeo for me, so I'm not going to leave him. And so he put it on ice. And then after Romeo, then he came back and he said, if you don't come, I'm not doing it. So then I did. I went and I was... Uh, um, commuting between Zurich and Cologne to do my dance performances in opera houses in both countries. And what I want us to stress as well, Daryl, because it sounds like a fantasy story, right? You come from Dominica, you migrate, then you get a scholarship to become a ballet dancer, and you, then you have all these productions that are made simply for you. But take a, tell us about the discipline that Ooh. was involved in your training and your practice to get you to the level where ballets were actually created just okay. for you. Now, I, was, I would probably have come to this point a little bit later, but let's come on to something. Sometimes, you know, when I say this, people say, oh, but you're so talented. And that really gets my goat. Because talent is going to get you through the door mm -hmm. the first time. It's not going to keep you in the room. Mm -hmm. That is called W-O-R-K, work. So. In ballet school, I had to be in class, ready to dance at eight o'clock in the morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, wait for it, and Saturday. Wow. So this is, um, this is physical work. Um, this is crafting the body. This is, you know, you, you go into the ballet school and you're like a chunk of stone. And by the time you come out, you're uh, a Leonardo da Vinci sculpture. You know, it's all, it's, it's all there. But it's not happening by itself. So you have to work. Oh boy, you have to work. And did Absolutely. I have injuries? Yes, I did. I had a really bad back injury at the end of the first year, which is a combination of, I suppose, too much strain, too much stress, 
too much too much workload on the body and this is also connected um, to an emotional challenge that I had because in the beginning of my first year at ballet school our father passed away and that oh, was sorry to hear that that uh, thank you appreciated that was a shock to the system for all of us and that shock manifested itself in my physical work later on right now i've, I've spent really a lot of time um, working with trauma working with people who are shocked because i i've had to go through this myself in in different ways and that was one that was one thing and i was i was actually quite depressed after that my um physiotherapist i said oh i'll never be able to do this she said oh, no 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 yes you will yes you will you have to know you have to understand what it is you are doing now up until this point i'm dancing on on wish on talent you know i want to do this i want to fly i want and but you can't work like that mm -hmm. you know you have to understand what are you working with you're working with your body your body is an instrument it's a machine it's mechanical it is mental it is emotional it is functional you have to understand the science of the body to be able to work with it, to make it strong, make it pliable. At the same time, open your mind. Be You have to develop all of these different antennae. So you take all of the influences from whatever it is you're working with and don't forget where you came from. I was Absolutely. always told, don't forget where you came from. You know, people are not going to... You know, I'm not going to be, uh, uh, I could never be a copy of um, some blonde European guy because I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm from Dominica and I look the way that I look. And it's because of that. I have to accept that and take that and put it up front and, and, and make myself the best version of Daryl that I can be. Yeah, and, I, and I'm so happy we're having this conversation because one of the things, and I'm so um, excited that you've already agreed to join us again for some future programs, because we also have to talk about how when, once you had the, the opportunity to, you were able to infuse some of your Caribbean heritage and some of your Afro-Caribbean heritage into performances. But in the interest of time, let's um, kind of move along and talk about how you transition from becoming a dancer to becoming a director. And then we want to talk a little bit more about Hurricane Maria and uh, the important uh, production that you did a year after Maria. So how did you transition from a dancer to a producer to a director? Okay, the, the, the dance, the active dance career, let's say is like eight years. Add on to that four years as an active career as an actor. Um, but choreography is something that I started doing, I discovered when I was already in Swindon. I had been studying piano, I had been studying music and composition, and when I suddenly was in the ballet studio, I realized that choreography is like composing, except you don't write notes on the paper, you have people bopping around. So when everybody else was making a piece, you know, we had these little, these little, uh, um, tasks, you know, make a piece and somebody does a duet with them and their best friend or a solo. I have seven people and I have people coming and going and like, you know, using the space and feeling as free as I would be if I was on the piano, I have like 10 fingers. So I'm hitting all those notes. Choreography I did from the beginning all the way through. And there is a, also a turning point connected with the, my, the, uh, the passing of my dad, where I realized that I needed to make a piece like right now. I, I just had to make this piece. I understand now that I was working through my grief. I understand now that I had already found a way to transmit all of this emotional energy into a tangible form, into, into body movement, into, into partner work, into formations. And so I created a piece with, uh, with my classmates and they were very shocked. I think everybody everybody was shocked because the content was not a nice piece of music and let's make some cool moves. The content was, I've just lost my dad. Mm -hmm. So I had six guys in a very beautiful formation, but six, so you can work it out, yes, pallbearers. And I had one guy, the sort of like leading man, 
and a young girl, and um, there was a relationship between the young girl and the man. It was based on a lot of trust and a lot of partnering, a lot of lifting, very harmonious. And then these six guys come in and separate them. They do some beautiful acrobatic stuff with the girl, and then they pick up the guy and they have him carried overhead and they walk off in a very stately procession. Of course, I don't need to explain this to you. This is this is me um, putting all of all of this, all of my my experience right away. Finding oh, it's finding the channel, and it was just the most organic thing to do. I could not have done otherwise. Anything else would have been a lie. So I've been creating choreographic work of great complexity with a lot of psychological pictures behind and finding it um finding it uh, like really easy to 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 transform all of those ideas into space people shape the lighting the choice of music the length of time um and all of this stuff and mm -hmm. so as i'm working as a choreographer i'm developing a a, a reputation as a choreographer as well mm -hmm. and as a result of one piece which i did um, a future director of the Opera House in Graz saw that and knew me already from 10 years before and was like, wow, I need to talk to you about what we should be doing with a dance company. And mm -hmm. there we go. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it speaks so very well of turning trauma into directing your entire career because you took your own personal trauma of losing your dad suddenly and it has created a, a very successful path for you along the way. So for anyone who's just joining us, we are speaking to Mr. Daryl Tula out of Austria in Europe, and he's an international performing arts and theater director, Dominican born. He left Dominica at the age of 17. And we're talking about his work in theater, performing arts, and how he's using his work in the area of conflict resolution and healing through the performing arts. So let's just take a pause and acknowledge some of uh, the people on Facebook, like we like to do. So we have Francine Harris, who is watching out in Toronto. Good evening, <laughs> Francis. Thank you for being here. Uh, Tina says, it was a pleasure listening to Daryl as a child, uh, reciting those poems at the small convent in the old building. <laughs> I could hear and see him from my family house. So someone's sharing a memory. Uh, Kaula Brohim Harris. Kaula. I Hi, Daryl. Good to see you. Hi, Kaula. Yes, Lorraine Del Sol is watching from Toronto. Lorraine, always a wonderful to see you. Uh, D. Minister David, good evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, Chislaine Gomez, great and interesting conversation. She's watching from Havana, Cuba. So we have the entire world represented here this evening, Daryl. And again, like I mentioned before, I want to thank you up front for agreeing to come back because we have so much to share on this topic and the work that you're doing in terms of conflict resolution and healing pain with the work that you're doing. But let us jump ahead since today is the anniversary of Hurricane Maria, if you don't mind, and talk about how that project came into being. Yeah. So um, again, it's it's uh, um, the, the the feeling of helplessness. Uh, you know, what 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 can I do? Now the hurricane has come again. We have all of this uh, all of this stuff to deal with. Um, I suppose if I was a, a constructor, I would want to build a bridge. Or um, yeah, but I'm not. What 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 I do is is the performance. And I, um, you know, I I I, I was thinking. Um, Art has to respond in a very responsible way, in a very um, serious and constructive way to things that happen. Um, I do not subscribe to the idea that art is entertainment, that, it, that it's a way of, of passing time so, so everybody, I don't know, feels good. I think you should feel good when you do it and when you experience art but it should also do something to you, you know? It should also transport your feelings. And how do you do this? You need to transform, you need to get it out, you need to turn it into something else. And, um, and so I came up with the idea of, um, uh, of going back home and doing a production, creating a production where the, the point of the production is to give everybody a channel to to get rid of 
all of this emotion that has been forced down into our stomachs and, and, and into our hearts, the, the feeling of loss. How do you cope with loss? Do you, do you pretend that you're okay? Do you say, oh, it will pass? Do you have nightmares because it's, it's, it's not out? Um, have you tamed the beast? Is it, is it, is it uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a theory about trauma transformation and, and, uh, and it is that first you, you, have, um, you have this seismic event which kind of like rocks you, which, 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 where, where you lose total control. Um, then you have this period of rumination where you try to make sense of things, but you will stay stuck in there and you won't move on until you manage to transform this to create a kind of a ladder so you get out of the you get out of this out of this valley. And one way of doing this is to turn your your experience into art. Um, one, it gives you a different way of processing the material. It is not, it is not so difficult. It's not so impossible. You can work with it. So, so it is not in control of you. You are in control of it. If you turn it into a thing of beauty, you will manage to transcend all, all, all of that. It's not saying that the thing didn't happen. It's saying the thing did happen. Now, how can I take that thing that happened and help somebody else to get over? Or, or how, how can I share this? And so I came up with the idea of O Maria. And this is based on, um, on two other pieces of literature um, in, uh, in America. There was, there is the, I just have to check my notes a little bit. Um, Lee Masters um, created a, a, a series of poems by walking through um, a graveyard and wondering, you know, what is the story behind these people? And this is called the Spoon River Anthology, written in 1915. And so it's just a collection of poems. It's just poems that, that are um, fictitious lives of people who are lying in the grave. Um, let's forward through to 1989 and Janet Hood and Bill Russell use that as a template to follow the AIDS quilt. And based on the different quilts of people who have died from AIDS, they write a set of um, monologues and songs, which is called Elegies for Angels, Punks and Raging Queens, which I have produced, which I have um, I have um, um, in, uh, included in, in a gala for World AIDS Day. And this, is, this was just like such a cool way of thinking, wow, so, so that, that's how we do it. Go to Dominica and get a whole set of people together, everybody who wants to, so it's a community thing, and everybody shares their, um, their experience of the hurricane. And instead of reading it out as a miserere, we turn it into a series of songs. Everybody in Dominica loves to sing. Everybody loves the musical. Everybody loves a concert. And so create this evening of song, O Maria, Songs and Stories of the Survivors. How did it work? I went down to Dominica with, uh, with Mauricio Nobili, who is an Italian musician, very good friend of mine, and Carol Alston, who is an American singer. Um, she teaches in Vienna, Mauricio works in Graz, and um, we've, we've collaborated together. They were both involved also in the gala for the Hurricane Maria. And we spent two weeks in Dominica uh, teaching songwriting, teaching singing. Teaching songwriting is a little bit of a difficult thing because everybody knows how to write a song, but does everybody know where to go and what to pull out so you get like really the, the, the heavy stuff? Because what I didn't want was a, a fun and game sort of like let's sing a nice song about Hurricane. No, I wanted us to go really deep down and find the points that hurt and take the points that hurt the most and transform them into the most beautiful pieces of music so that we could perform this and touch the audience and experience uh, experience the transcendence of, of, out, of, out of the misery, turn the thing into a beautiful performance, which is as honest as, as, as we could want to be with the art. And so that's the story of, uh, of O Maria. Yes, and, and such a, a powerful way to deal with trauma. Trauma transformation um, is what you call it, taking that trauma and not making light of it. Actually go into the place, the source of the hurt 
and creating something beautiful that is a release, would you say, of the hurts that, that folks are experiencing because of Maria? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I have a picture in my mind, you know, sometimes you something happens and it becomes this unnamed beast. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you name the beast, it's something else. You know, the book says name the beast. And I'm saying, no, you sit on the neck of the beast and you hold it by the horns and you ride the beast until morning. And then the beast is so damn tired that it'll just like flop down and you realize mm -hmm. it only had two legs or something. You know, then you 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 stand over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's such a powerful thing because in psychology, we also call that naming your emotion because sometimes we wake up, we're in a terrible mood. We have no idea what's going on. But once you put a name to it, for example, you say, today I am feeling anxious because or today I am feeling overwhelmed before because it's part of the healing process. Yes. It's part of getting you to the answer, to the release so that you can address what is going on internally with you. So even, even if you've not experienced some trauma, we all have human emotions. Yeah. And like you rightly said, simply naming the emotion, you get a handle on the yeah. emotion. So you've done something wonderful, Daryl, and you sent us some video clips. Of, um, you, wanna, you, wanna, you wanna show something? Yes, so if you don't mind, I'd like to pull up um, maybe a couple of the clips that you sent us. Okay, so, um, maybe, maybe we want to start with insane. Insane. So let me get that one. Okay, so this is this is this is Shirley Charles. Uh huh. Um, and uh, it, you know, we the the idea of of of, uh, of 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 that song would be, you know, first we started sort of like very up up, you know, six o'clock in the evening before the hurricane. We think it's maybe. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so six o'clock in the evening, we think it's just a normal storm. And in the middle of the song, people are saying, oh, it changed from category three to category five. Okay. And then we had a set of some songs which are about when the hurricane's really like beating down. Mm -hmm. And then the feeling of helplessness afterwards is like, how, how do we, you know, you, 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 you get out there and you just don't understand what the hell is going on. How do we put this into a song? And surely comes up with this insane. Let's go for that. Yes, let's take a listen. The statues of flesh and bone can't trust them, but can't leave them alone. No one's in their right. Reaching on 
The wind, the rain, incessant howling, going on all night long. You take my roof and my neighbors too. Not no, letting up, up still, still breaking up. Your, your eyes pass by. Why are you angry, Maria? Why are you angry so? We need a break, Maria. Why are you angry so? Wow, that was powerful. That was simply powerful. And, and for anyone who's who's um, watching right now, is that Lady S, the Calypsonian? That is. That is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I got goosebumps. Did anybody else in the on the Facebook Live get goosebumps? Because I certainly got goosebumps by the power of her singing and the the you know the lyrics of the song. Would you like us to share another clip? Yeah. Yes. So which yeah, one? Which yeah, one yeah. Go you know, and, and talking talking about the lyrics, um, we I I I, I had a, a couple of um, songs um, that I used as a um, to teach. You know, like what can you put inside of lyrics? So we we studied something from Miriam Makeba, from Stephen Sondheim. You know, where can you go with a song? You know, how much can you get out of it? And um, there's another song which I think is pretty amazing. This was written by Francina, Shirley, and, and Marie. Um, it's called Three Iguanas Serenity. Um, I won't read you like the whole text, but I'll just read you like two, two things. You know, um, we, 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 had a, we had like a set of tasks that I gave, you know, you got to write on this and then spent a lot of time rewriting, rewriting, getting down inside, throwing out all of the, of, all of the fluffy bits. And then you end up with something like, the sea is enraged, joined by angry rivers. The waters find no rest. So back to the shore, it spit out the forest that it cannot digest. I mean, this is just, uh, oh. um, you know, whimpering dogs joined by wailing cats, the rolling mountain slides. A bus served the mountain out to sea, back to shore. Now in my yard it abides. Mm -hmm. You know, a pretty, pretty amazing um, text that was coming out. And, and maybe we should just like introduce uh, one more, which is a little bit like up tempo. We didn't know yes. was, some of the song is up tempo. Yes. But in the up tempo one, uh, this was written by Keja. She to be put it into a, into a blues thing. Um, you know, she, she, she's talking about uh, waking up or she's singing about waking up the next morning. Mm -hmm. And um, the, you know, you will hear it in the text, what, you know, this beautiful sunrise um, that is describing or that's lighting up the destruction of the hurricane. Yes, let's see. We have it right here. And... Huh, it played earlier. Let's see if we can get it to play. Oh, there we go. Yes. And so is a tree, as 
who's just joining us, those were two clips from O oh Maria, uh, your creation after, I was going to say tribute, but we really don't want to have a tribute to Maria, such a devastating storm, but just your composition, your production, your way of giving back. And you also talked about the amount of funds that you raised for this particular production, because I think at that point, we were just all interested in how we can give back to Dominica. I joined with like TDN Radio. So we as Dominicans overseas, we were just all trying to find a way to give back to Dominica. So what was the response to that production? We have Glenda Schillingford, who said, I was honored to be at that concert. It was well organized and performed. It was amazing. So just tell us the response to, to that particular production and if we can still access the entire production. Um, so and the, the response was, was fantastic, overwhelming. You know, at the end, everybody just sat there and some people came up to me and they said, I cried, I could just see myself. And, <laughs> you know, you, you, you saw yourself, you heard your own story, you felt you felt part of the community. You felt, you know, like we're all in this together. Um, we can laugh about this now. We've we've gained some distance to this now. Um, you know, people had a chance to revisit their revisit their memory and and process it and talk about it. Um, and uh, you know, even even now, some people have have sent some some messages to me earlier today. You know, like what what an amazing thing. Um, I went back to Dominica. So this uh, this recording that you see now is from the the premiere in August of 2018. I went back in uh, November of 2018 for independence and we did a, a, a revamp during which point I had um, written some, some, some piano accompaniments and we had a steel band voice in as well. And we did some more performances, one in the Kalinago district mm -hmm. and also again at, um, at Alliance Francaise. And the plan is, I suppose, at one point to pull it out and do a proper recording. We started the recording; that's still in progress. And um, and take this take this to the next level. Take the take the O Maria, you know, uh, more to a, to to a, a, a bigger a, big, a bigger space. Take it to completion. Yeah. So fantastic, and thank you so much for giving back to Dominica in such a significant way. Now we talked about in the beginning that we have so much more of your work to share. Your work in Uganda, your work with um, children of war and, and the traumas that everyone has experienced. But I say, let's leave that for our another time together. What do you think? Yeah, uh, because hey, we've um, <laughs> we've really like covered quite a lot of ground, and then and I'm sure that um, there's a lot more ground that we should cover another time. And um, I'm really looking forward to joining you again. Yes, yes, and of course, it's what time for you now? Midnight, I would presume. That's the one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so let's take a look. Let's take a look yep. at who else has joined us on the Facebook Live. We have Norman Stowe, and he said, "Absolutely brilliant." Uh, let's see who else we have right here, Glenda. 
uh, Mava, oh Maria, it was indeed a beautiful performance. Darius Etienne, his knowledge is incredible. Just listening, one can learn a lot in all artistic forms. Uh, Glenda Shirley Charles is, she has a beautiful voice. So that's what she says. Let's take a look. Uh, I think I saw Arnold. So Arnold Tulo is here. So Arnold, welcome to the program. Thank Yo, you bro. for being here. Your brother. That's right. Chislin, such a wonderful, powerful song. Rosalind, wow, her voice is very impressive. So all talking about um, Shirley. Lorraine, Shirley is amazing. She's so versatile. So lots of positive feedback. Cassie Bider, please let him, oops, I missed that. Let him know Roberta is online. Hey. At work, but online. Is that Roberta Tulo? Yes, That's I remember right. Roberta That's from Convent High School. <laughs> Yeah, that's my sister. Yes, she was a year or two ahead of me. Roberta, great to see you on the Facebook Live. Francine Harris, I'm the head of our Convent Alumni Association. I think all listening are looking forward to hearing from Daryl again. So I can certainly agree with that. Catherine, listening from California. Hi, Daryl. Thank you for giving back. So lots of great comments, Daryl. So I want to thank you again for being here for the very first part of our presentation. And it's all about promoting and celebrating um, who we are as Dominica. And it is so timely that we got to do this um, interview, this connection during the time of Maria. So do you have any final thoughts as we get ready to wrap up our first yeah. episode? No, I listen, I, I think you're doing um, an amazing job. Um, of course, I'm buttering about myself so that you say, Daryl, won't you come back? But put that aside. Um, I think I think what you're doing is it, it's so important because it's giving us, um, the ones who are not like in the ring in Dominica, a chance to to communicate, to to, to find out what, what, what we're doing, what everybody else is doing. And I suppose... Um, the people back home are kind of like wondering, you know, who are these people? You know, wh wh what are they doing? You know, they're not here, um, but we're not there, but we're here and we're all doing our bit. And thanks to you, Simone, it, it's possible to make this connection. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and to keep keep the network going, keep asking questions and keep 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 looking for answers and keep sharing those answers. Because it doesn't make sense if we do anything and it doesn't connect back home. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, it's yeah, and, and you're so very true because for me, it is really about providing the motivation and inspiration when we have someone like you, Dara, who was able to live Dominica and make your own way through the world through the help of your angels, like you call them, through creating important relationships. So for me, it's about building what I like to call social capital, where we're able to create these relationships. Maybe someone watching is interested in the performing arts and has no idea how to get started. Maybe someone watching has a child who's interested in performing arts and we can reach out to you so that we can have that conversation to say that you're on the right track. It's gonna be challenging. It's going to take a lot of hard work but you will be able to succeed the same way I was able to succeed. So I yeah. want to thank you. I want to thank you. You've, you. you've, you've just given actually. You've just given me actually one little message. Yes. Um, I'm constantly looking out for little Darrells, little people who kind of like don't know where to start. And if you give them the right chance to start, they can do something. And it doesn't depend on, on your starting point, you know, the starting point where you are in life. It depends on your starting point. And if somebody can see that and, and help you channel that, mm -hmm. I've been really fortunate to have people who have seen this. And so I'm always on the lookout for little ones like this. So um, if anybody feels they need to reach out, then let's do it. Yeah, and, and you have your website. I'm going to put a link to your website um, in the comments area. So if anyone wants, wants to reach out to you, and of course, you're on Facebook as Daryl Tulo. So you're pretty easy to find on Facebook, but I will link as well to the alpha group. Uh, dot org and so anyone who's looking uh, for you can reach out to you that way but I want to thank you for reaching out initially and for accepting my invitation to be here 
Uh, you know, so we've, we, we continue to reach all the ends of the world. We've had people as far as South Sudan. We've had Gordon Henderson from Paris. We've had people from the UK, Canada, just about every island in the Caribbean. So we continue to take our audience around the world to promote and celebrate who we are and to continue to build the social capital that I was just talking about. And again, you've agreed to join us again. So we're looking forward to when next that will be possible. And if you have been following us, you know that we have a number of series already and you will be part of the series that we are going to cons we're going to talk about how are you impacting your world? How are we using our talents, our skills, our experiences to simply positively impact the world? And we will it will be part of our other series that we have. We have a, a series called Live Out Loud of people who tell us to live our best lives now, live unapologetically. And we have health and nutrition, mental and spiritual health. We have our Sase New program, which is our Creole speaking pro program. Esusapale Creole Daryl. Of course. <laughs> you said it in English. That means no. <laughs> you have to answer in Creole. <laughs> I'm a little bit out of practice. <laughs> well, that's okay. So but, we but, have... but don't get don't get on my case. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. Okay, d'accord, bo, bo. Yes, so, you know, we have so many different series that we do right here on this platform. And we also have Havis Badwell, who is going to be our financial advisor. So for me, it's about creating that global community, that international village, where we're able to support each other and provide all the information that we need to be successful. So we are only getting started. We are thrilled to have yet another opportunity to bring you great guests, positive programming, and to continue to be a light in this very dark world. So don't forget to follow Push Past 10, click the notification button to let us, uh, so that you won't miss another live. And I wanna thank you everyone for your support. And let's just take a few final comments to make sure we didn't miss anyone on the Facebook Live because Daryl has to go to bed. It's after 12 midnight in Austria. So let's just take a couple more comments and then we will wrap up the program for today. Uh, Martha Media, very impressive. Kudos to Simone and Daryl. Bernadette Wilkinson, you're an inspiration to many. Francine Harris, yes, Simone is indeed showcasing Dominicans in an extremely positive manner. Thank you for that, Francine. Beautifully said, Daryl, Lorraine, uh, Laya, he speaks Creole like me. <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine is putting you on the spot. <laughs> Rosalind Sebre, uh, Simone, this was amazing. Louisa, good night. Louisa is also in the UK, so she as well is up late or looking, uh, watching us. So Daryl, the final word is yours as we end the program. Rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> so I will see you. We'll see you again for the next episode. Yes, you will. Yes, and everybody, stay tuned so we can let you know when that will be. And with that, we wish you an enjoyable rest of your day, and we look forward to connecting with you right here on Push Past Ten. Again, I am Simone Matthew, and it is always wonderful to bring you such uh, positive an enlightening program. So you have yourself a wonderful rest of your day. Until next time, take care. All right.